Bob, good to see you. Glad to be with you. And uh, welcome to our first session of the Education at the Crossroads interview and lecture series. There is a good reason why you were the first one I invited, because I think we can say for many years now, we have been working together, be it from different sides of the Atlantic Ocean, but we have been working together in education. And I thought, uh, as we are living through these extraordinary times, uh, we thought here at the International Theological Institute that it would be good to have a closer look at where we stand with education. And considering the fact that you and I have spent a lot of time speaking about this and uh, sharing thoughts and ideas, uh, I thought it would be very fitting to have you as the first person on this show. And I have an immediately uh, a first question for you, but maybe I may briefly introduce you to our viewers. Bob Luddy is the president and CEO of Captive Air, a wonderful company in uh, Carolina. Actually, I have to say North Carolina. Um, where, uh, amongst others, kitchen ventilation and various other, other products are being marketed worldwide. And Bob Luddy, however, has been, as I wrote in the introduction, a serial school founder as well. And so in that, he is truly an educator. And it is in these times that education is so much in turmoil around the world now, of course, even more so because of the whole corona crisis, we need not so much experts as we hear today all the time. We are being ruled mostly by experts. What we need in education is real educators. And I think we can say that Bob Luddy is one of such real educators because he has the hands-on experience of schooling. So, Bob, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I love the topic. <laughs> yeah, and it's, 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 it's a great honor to have you because uh, for many years I've received a lot of inspiration from you. So my first question today is actually the most important question I would say, and that is what motivated you as an entrepreneur and business owner to found so many schools? Well, from my experience of hiring people, I ascertained many deficiencies. And also some observation in the marketplace, uh, friends of my uh, children, uh, students that I met in the marketplace, I realized that while some of them might have a fairly good experience, too many of them did not which is gonna undermine their opportunities in a lifetime, both for themselves and to contribute. And finally, by uh, about 1997, I actually got very mad about it in that as adults, we always claim that we love our children. We, we wanna do everything for them, but if we're not educating them, it doesn't matter what else we're doing. Uh, they're gonna have a very difficult time in life. So I decided to become engaged in education initially running for school board, which grace, uh, thankfully to God, I lost, but that led me right into forming a public charter school, which opened in 1998. And how was that for you, Bob, the fact that um, being an entrepreneur, and I compared a little bit to myself because I also rolled into education as a former attorney. Uh, how was it for you as a business owner to start a school where you are not necessarily a pedagogist or a teacher, you didn't you know, get a degree in teaching, like I didn't get a degree in teaching. How was it for you to enter this complete new world? Well, I'll, I'll give you an interesting thought. Um, we were gonna open in July of 1998. We received this charter in March. So we only had four months to get a building, hire teachers, gain students. And what I realized was the bar is so low. Mm -hmm. If I can't move to a higher level, then, then I've got a real, real problem. 
so I geared everything to say, I'm going to introduce a new level of education mm -hmm. that will wow parents and students. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so one of the things I told our teachers a couple of days before we opened, and we didn't hire our, we needed eight full-time teachers. We didn't hire the last teacher until days before, maybe three or four days before school was going to open. Sounds so I said familiar. to them, you have all taught in a school before, mm -hmm. and therefore, to some degree, you are a veteran teacher. When this school opens day one, I want people to have the perception that this school has been in business for 10 years. We execute mm -hmm. perfectly. I put all the books on top of the desks, which very often at that time, our lo local public schools never had the books even week weeks and months later. And then I went out and bought all the supplies that, that normally parents would buy, put them on top of the desk. So when the parents came to open, open house, they said, oh, you don't need to buy these supplies. We're supposed to do that. I said, I know that, I'm making a point. We're ready to, to uh, teach these children come eight o'clock Monday morning. And that's exactly what happened. So it created a really good perception. And I already had our teachers on notice this is going to act like a school that's 10 years old. And that's exactly what happened. And by the end of year one, we had a massive waiting list. So the bar was low. We set a much higher standard. And within a short period of time, it's accepted by the parents. That, that's interesting what you say, Bob, that one of the things you discovered and that also motivated you is that you saw that the bar was so low. What would you say from your many years of experience now in education and yourself coming from, from another field of expertise and having made that your own, what would you say is the number one, the main purpose of education? To me, the, the main purpose is to look at what are we trying to achieve? We wanna have individuals who are think thinkers who are well-grounded philosophically. And from that thinking, they're able to communicate both verbally and in writing, and that they're willing to take action. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, who went to the University of uh, Vienna, uh, talked about beyond thinking, we have to act. If we only think and we don't act, then we don't have any outcomes. So good philosophy, thinking skills, communication skills, and being a correct member of our society that achieves good outcomes. That's where I'm trying to get to. I find it a very uh, striking and very encouraging because I think that anybody who spends a little bit of more time delving into education comes to that same conclusion where you say, it's about learning how to think. It's about thinking. and. That, of course, if we want to teach children or students how to think, that they need, obviously, the good philosophers. Yeah? They need a good, sound philosophy to help them in that process of thinking. And then they need sound communication and also behavioral skills to be able to then do something with that thinking. But looking at that learning to think, isn't... Isn't it true also in your experience, at least that is what I have experienced uh, throughout uh, my career also in education, is that that is exactly what is missing generally in the education systems in countries around the world. And that has to do with the fact, and would you agree with that analysis that our society, our materialistic society has become so focused on producing consumers and who go and buy and producing producers who are part of the production process that we have become so obsessed with skills oriented education that we have forgotten the fundamental questions and the why and the how we come to that. Would you say that that analysis rings true? That's perfectly true. Uh, if you think about the Catholic Church created classical education. And to me, classical education is says we learn from the masters. 
Um, recently, we had a historian, uh, Dr. McClay, in to speak at Thales, and he talked about classic education. Why would you abandon this rich body of knowledge? But that's exactly <clears throat> excuse me, what's happened in education. And it's also happened within our Catholic schooling. So somehow classic curriculum, we got so far away from it. The average person today doesn't know what classic studies mean. Mm -hmm. It doesn't compute with them in any way. Although I will say that in the last month, I've had three groups around the country contact me saying, we would like to start classical schools. So mm -hmm. I think there is, is a bit of a renaissance in education. Uh, if you look at the US, if you went back to the early 20th century, the progressives began to essentially discard whether it was the constitution, the will of God, good educational standards. So for more than a hundred years, they've tried to abandon what's really good and substitute pure pragmatic, as you have stated. And that has not worked well mm -hmm. uh, in, in many, many ways. Uh, if you look at uh, 50 years back, people worked harder, they were better educated, uh, they were more in tune with our society. So we've, we've lost a lot by abandoning good educational standards and they need to be revived. Now, some years ago, Bob, I read a study, and this, this might uh, sound familiar to, to you. Unfortunately, I still haven't refound the source, but I read a study where um, business owners in the United States were being asked what would be their preference in hiring when it comes to what sort of education people have had. And one of the conclusions that came out of that study was that in fact, business owners would prefer to have employees, to hire employees who had had some sort of classical liberal education, whether it preferably at school, because that's already the age when the young people have to start to learn to think, and uh, then also possibly in college, uh, is that an experience you have had as a business owner? Absolutely. Every employer wants a self-reliant individual. Right. And if everything, we have a little bit of a joke about this idea of training. If you have to be trained to do every task, your mm -hmm. value is minimal. Right. Um, the classic edu education prepares you to deal with uh, complex problems, to do your own research, to come to your own conclusions, to work within a group to good outcomes. Individuals that only learn or who are trained to do something uh, are greatly devalued just because of a poor formation. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, employers may not always express it in the classical curriculum, mm -hmm. but the outcomes of classical curriculum are exactly what every single employer wants. And um, wouldn't you say that maybe one of the reasons why, uh, why probably in most states around the world, it is not a matter of policy to provide young individuals with such an education because our states are ever more growing into nanny states and probably a nanny state doesn't necessarily like people who think too independently. Could that be a motivation either consciously or unconsciously? I think it probably could be. I mean, they have this concept in some of the high schools of school to work. Mm -hmm. And it's back to that same concept where they're saying, we're going to teach you something to get a job. Mm -hmm. But as we know that jobs in the modern workplace are very ephemeral. So then they start talking about retraining. Mm -hmm. individuals that undergo a good classical education don't need retraining because they're self-reliant and essentially they are reinventing themselves every single day with their reading, their thought, their discussion, mm -hmm. the way they act. And again, every employer wants that type of person. My uh, mentor, Dr. Bill Peterson, who is a student and colleague of Mises, talks about self-actuated students, mm -hmm. um, thinkers, um, 
researchers at, at nauseum because he knows uh, this is the purpose of education. It, the purpose is not to memorize facts because right. Google has a very good command of the facts, as we know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to have enough information and knowledge about facts so we know where to research, et cetera. But memorizing endless facts that you're going to forget is not going to make you a productive person in our society. Right. And schooling has almost come down to that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's gotten way off base because it defies all traditions, all good philosophy. And we're, we're going to have to get back to classics. Let's speak a little bit, Bob, because that follows very logically from, from what you've just been telling. Let's speak a little bit about character formation, mm -hmm. because it seems that that is, if we look around us, you know, I often tell my, I often tell my students, um, my students here at the university, I often tell them, speaking about character formation, we were in 2008 when we had the great financial crisis and the collapse of many firms. I still remember how many people were completely surprised and said, how is this possible? Because you have all these great bankers and financial specialists there who all have MBAs from all those very expensive business schools and universities. and." You know, I mean, they really knew what they were doing. And then something like this happens. And I was always surprised how few people actually realized that, at least in my view, this financial crash, at least in part, was a consequence of our skills-oriented uh, education because it teaches people skills, but it doesn't form their characters. And what role do you think schools should play actively in character formation? Character formation should be first and foremost. So if you look at the outcomes from our schools, the number one outcome is integrity. Right. And if you think about it, most individuals in the world fail over integrity more so than competence. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have integrity, you really have nothing because nobody can trust you. We recently interviewed someone and we ascertained that we had concerns about their integrity. So that person obviously is not going to get the job. Mm -hmm. So any concern related character integrity is going to undermine their future career. And yet, as you've mentioned, many of these financial people have become what I call gamers. Mm -hmm. No rules. Anything goes. So they may have the intelligence to know this is very risky behavior, but if they can get away with it, they do it because the schools have not formed them in good conscience and good integrity as the number one thing they need to do. Right. I can tell you at uh, LaSalle University where I went, as a freshman, our Christian brother of finance and accounting teacher said, the first thing you're gonna learn here is fiduciary duty. And the second thing is you're going to learn how not to be a gamer mm -hmm. and how to follow correct processes of finance and accounting. And that's stuck with me all these years. I think you would find that a rare occurrence today in B-schools. Right. If you um, look, and I come here to my third main question, if you look at the current global crisis in which we find ourselves uh, surrounding the corona discussion and theme and issues. One of the things we've seen happening in education is that in light speed time, education has moved online. Now, I have serious doubts about that, although certainly uh, certain elements, you know, let's call it digital elements in education, there is nothing wrong with that, for example, children and students uh, have to learn how to work with computers and how to usefully make use of the internet. We all agree with that. But as we have seen education move online because of the corona crisis, we have also seen its weaknesses. And in that framework, I would like to ask you, what do you see in the current situation in which we are? What do you see as the biggest challenge of education today? The biggest challenge is getting back to a correct structure. So for example, 
many schools are doing online. We're doing a certain amount of it for individuals that are afraid to come to school. Mm-hmm. But we know definitively they're, they're falling behind. If I look back on the people I learned the most from, it was a very good professor that had a high amount of knowledge and wanted to make sure that I was able to understand that knowledge. So that close connection to really smart people Mm -hmm. is imperative in the educational process. And it's also imperative in the character formation because these things are, are going on concurrently. We can learn certain things online depending on our personal discipline, level of maturity, intelligence, and interest. But we can't learn everything online. Mm -hmm. Uh, Additionally, we find that many of the students online are not paying attention. Right. Uh, So we even had some cases where we said, students not paying attention, they can either come to school or they can't continue because this is not a worthwhile process. So essentially we have to go back to where we came from, classic curriculum, really good professors, uh, continuous character formation. And for every one of us, we're human, we're challenged and we we will make mistakes. Uh, My mentor, Dr. Bill Peterson often stated, none of us get get it all right. So we need to be constantly thinking, are we correct about what we're doing? And that's the process that the classic education should take us through. None of that exists in 80% of the education that's going on today. Would you, would you say when we speak about character formation, and we are, of course, in, in, in this interview, speaking specifically about character formation in the framework of classical education, <clears throat> knowing that the wisdom that comes from us from previous ages is something that we can actually learn from and re, re-understand again in these times. But when we speak about character formation, wouldn't you say, as we speak about the greatest challenge of today, on the one hand, of course, being the digital age that can be exaggerated and cuts the personal contact that students do need with their professors to grow as human beings. We all need that interaction. But how can we also pay more attention to the character formation of the teachers? Because no matter how much say and read and teach about character formation for our students, whether it's at schools or at universities, when we, the teachers, are not a living example of that daily struggle to work on ourselves for self-discipline and everything, this continuous learning. And as you just said, this realization that none of us ever has everything right. Uh, We're all human beings and are weak. So how can we encourage our teachers, our professors to continuously grow themselves Well, you know, if you think about it, classic education, education in general, stemmed from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So now fast forward 2,000 years later, the secular world wants no part of Catholicism, of Christianity, of traditional values. You can't teach good character formation in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So um, unless we accept that Christianity makes absolute sense from a character formation for our society, we can't get back there. So if you look at American teacher schools, they're not teaching anything about character formation. Mm -hmm. They're teaching many erroneous concepts to these teachers. Uh, So what we try to do is hire young teachers, retrain them based on our culture and our values. And we've had pretty good success with that. But what should, what has to eventually go on, we need a large contingent of well-formed individuals based on very sound philosophy, which essentially is Christianity. Um, And that gives us a basis of long-term thinking. If we throw out the Bible and we throw out the best philosophers that existed in the world, which is essentially what secular world wants to do, Mm -hmm. we have no basis of character formation. Because that's interesting what you're saying, because 
we see that a lot, you know, um, you see that, for example, here in continental Europe too, there are um, various initiatives of classical education. But the interesting thing is, is that many of these, um, so to say, refound classical schools stop after the Roman time, so to say. So they will, they will appreciate the Greco-Roman tradition. And of course, especially the Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, and you know, the endless amounts of wisdom they have to share with us where it comes to classical education and also character formation. But as, as you rightly say, they stop usually after the Romans and then make a jump, uh, so to say, jump over the Christian tradition and then come to either the Enlightenment or, or, or to, to modernism. And I think you're absolutely, uh, modernity, and I think you're absolutely right when you're saying that we are missing something essential when we pass over Christianity. And I think it's so important for people to realize you do not need even to be a Christian yourself to be able to objectively see that the Christian tradition has much to say about education and has much to say about character formation. There seems to be almost this fear uh, of coming close to the Christian tradition because it's some, somehow considered by many in the secular world as out of vogue, but it would be like cutting the roots of a tree and saying, you know, there, there are these two roots of the tree that we like, but we're going to cut out, cut out one of the other main roots, which will ultimately lead to the, to the tree to die. Have you experienced the same uh, ambivalence towards our Western intellectual tradition in the sense that one very valuable part is taken, but the other very valuable part is rejected. Absolutely. You know, there's a book that was recently produced by Cato, and they looked at uh, a number of factors around the world, uh, famine, uh, democracy, literacy, and the trend lines are mostly very good. They don't look at the moral issues. Uh, so we've turned into a much more pragmatic society, but that society also turns into every man for himself. And that's why we have these sort of terrible political arguments, I think. We don't have good sound philosophy. It's just whatever I get for myself and my family now is all that counts. Um, so for the last, I say, 100 years, they've tried to really root out Christianity, right. philosophy. They just right. strip it all out of the university. And they're, they're producing individuals that their only values are sports games, entertainment. It almost reminds you of the pre-Christ Roman Empire. <laughs> right. um, where what was important was the circus and days off. We're kind of headed back there. Right. I do see some resurgence of many individuals reject these ideas mm -hmm. and they want to go back to the basics. Right. And those are the individuals that are going to lead us to a better society. And I think it will happen. Well, th thank you, Bob. I think that's a, that's a very encouraging thought. And I would, like to, uh, I would like to conclude with asking you, maybe building on that, what is a final advice or thought of um, encouragement you would like to give to young parents, young teachers or older teachers, anybody involved in education or formation of any sort, looking at the challenges that are facing us today as we are, as the title of this interview series says, education at the crossroads. What would be uh, an encouraging advice or words you would like to give them? Well, every single individual can make a difference in this world. So I would encourage individuals not so much to complain. Now, it's fine to complain and to ascertain what the challenges are, right. but then spend all of their time trying to learn more, trying to form coalitions, try to move toward the good and I see much evidence of that. As a matter of fact, in here in North Carolina, public school attendance continues to decline in an aggregate basis year by year. Mm -hmm. So we have more parents homeschooling. We have more private schools. 
We have more uh, kind of micro schools where there might be 10 or 12 children in a school. And many of them are doing a remarkably, incredibly good job. Right. I've got several homeschoolers that work here for me. So be active, do something positive on your own, and that will help form your whole family. Right. And it, it will eventually transform the world. Or it, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave with a quote, uh, Lily Von Hillebrand said, if you wanna change the world, change yourself. Yes, thank you, Bob. I think that's, that's the most important that we have always to be reminded of, that uh, changing the world starts with myself. So thank you very much, Bob, for uh, these uh, inspiring moments together. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's as always a, a great joy to speak with you and a great honor to count you among my friends. And I look forward to continuing our conversations and the work we do together. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.